It's time for Tycoons of Small Biz, spotlighting the true backbone of the American economy, the true tycoons of business in America, the owners, founders, and CEOs of small businesses. The show's hosts, Austin Peterson and Landon Mance, are registered representatives of Lincoln Financial Advisors Corporation, a broker-dealer, member SIPC, and registered investment advisor. The views expressed by your hosts, Austin and Landon, are not necessarily the views of Lincoln Financial Advisors. Let's lean in as Austin and Landon connect with this week's Tycoons. Good afternoon, Tycoons. This is Austin Peterson, and we are live today on Tycoons of Small Biz. Uh, Landon will not be on the show today. Landon, many of you know, uh, recently had some premature twins. It's been about uh, four or five weeks. Sorry, Landon, I don't know the exact date. Um, but the second one, the boy, uh, Hendrix, came home yesterday. And so finally got them out of the NICU. Everything's going well. Both of them are home now, and, and hopefully things are going well. But it was just too new to, for him to be on the show today. So it'll just be me today. But I'm lucky enough to be joined by Lisa Riley of Delta Business Advisors today. And she's a local business owner here. So we're kind of getting a twofer because she's a business owner, but she also serves small businesses and works with them on preparing for that inevitable exit. So excited to have you in studio today, Lisa. Thanks for being here. Thank you for having me, Austin. Yeah. So Lisa, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself personally and uh, professionally, kind of how you got to where you are today. And we'll go from there, see, uh, see where the conversation takes us. We've had a very interesting, eclectic life I've lived. I started out as a university professor. Oh. I taught for about 10 years. And then uh, when my husband had the opportunity to move here to Arizona, I lived in Nebraska, we did. We came. The academic world does not allow for transitions in the same manner as the business world. <laughs> so I ended up building our house. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> with your bare hands, I'm sure. I mean, with a lot of help and a lot of contractors yeah. um, helping out. And the city inspectors were just fabulous. So I always have to say, for those who are doing it themselves or with help, befriend those city inspectors. They will make your life a lot easier. <laughs> oh, yeah, for sure. And they can also make it very difficult. So, yeah. And then um, after that, I thought, what the heck do I do? And I like most, didn't really understand that you could sell small businesses or assist business owners when there's something to sell. In fact, I had one back in Nebraska that I just kind of passed along. It was an mm. evaluation firm, and I just passed my clients on because who knew somebody would, might want to buy it? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, absolutely. There's not a market like the stock market, right, where you're buying individual shares of a business for small businesses, but there's definitely a market for them. Uh, and so um, I'm a researcher by trade. So I researched and I said, okay, there's a lot going on. And of course, we have the baby boom generation that's getting ready to transition a very large amount of wealth. And we've been saying this for about 10 years now. Yeah. Now it's really getting to that critical point for, for most because they want to do something else or yeah. they want to leave their legacy in somebody else's hands or their spouse wants them to do something else. Yeah. Um, but there's there's a large um, transition that's probably going to go on for some people and those who have not prepared their business properly for sale may be very disappointed in the amount that somebody's willing to pay for it. Or like myself, they may just end up closing the doors or passing their clients on to somebody else. Yeah. And so I thought, I need to help people so their value can come back to them. Blood, sweat, and tears. We've all gone through it. Yep. Yeah, these business owners, like you said, especially the, the baby boomers today, they've really put their blood, sweat, and tears into these businesses for a long period of time. And they want to be able to get something out of it. And sometimes it's just being you know passed to the next generation. Mm -hmm. But there's still an exit there. We still want to be able to monetize that in a, in a way and, and make it beneficial to the owner that's selling, but then also in a way that works for the next generation, or it could be an outside seller. So there's an awful lot of, of different 
things to talk about when it comes to exiting a business. Mm -hmm. And the big thing is, and you actually used this term before we went live on radio, and I use it with my clients all the time, is that exit on your terms, Mm -hmm. right? Everybody's going to exit their business at some point. We can choose whether it's vertical or horizontal, Mm -hmm. right? Yes. (laughs) Um, But we want to be able to make sure that we're exiting on our terms and, and in a way that's financially feasible for all parties. Correct. Because that's really what it comes down to is your business is ultimately worth what somebody's willing to write a check for it rather than what some formula tells you it's worth. Correct. Right? Before I jump into this next thing that I wanted to mention, I just real quick, because I'm curious, what subject did you teach as a professor? I'm a sociologist, a research and statistician. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> Not quite the business world, but I love it. Yeah. And I use it every day. Yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it certainly, sociology and, and that type of a background certainly helps you to, to understand the mind of a business owner and, and those sorts of things. So I'm sure it does help you every day, but uh, yeah. interesting. And the transition, which we'll talk about in the future, but one thing that most people overlook when they're looking at buying or selling their business is what's the culture they're yeah. passing on? Oh, and absolutely. does it fit? Yep, absolutely. Matter of fact, I... I I purchased an RV not too long ago for my family. We're getting to that stage. My youngest actually has a year left in high school. And so we're kind of transitioning a little bit and thinking we can be a little bit more mobile as a couple, my wife and I. Mm -hmm. And the RV dealership that we purchased the RV from is going through a transition right now. So they just sold the business and the employees are having a difficult time with the change in culture, with the change in software programs, with everything that they do differently than they've been accustomed to for a very long time. And so, you know, there can be really, really good things, but you have to prep for all of that. And it's, it's, and that's a very good point. It's not just financial. Correct. Yeah. I, I believe, hopefully I'm not wrong, but I believe it was Stephen Covey that said, begin with the end in mind. Right. And I don't think that business owners are accustomed to doing that. Right. And many business owners aren't even sure what they're building when they start. Right. They, they may know that they don't want to work for somebody else, Um, but, and so they just, you know, start, you know, I guess we had a few weeks ago, a a client of mine, they started this business because he just didn't want to work for anybody else, had an opportunity to fix somebody's oven at a restaurant and realized that he made more money doing that in a couple of hours than he made in a week working for somebody else. And that's how his business was born. And fast forward, you know, years later, and it's a multi-million dollar revenue business and the next generation's involved. And so it's kind of become more than he would have ever envisioned. And so, and a, and a lot of business owners start that way. So they're really not thinking about that exit. And so hopefully they're meeting with somebody like you and, and like me, honestly, to prepare themselves for that exit many, many years before that exit actually becomes a reality, mm-hmm. right? Yeah, we like to tell people three to five years at the minimum before you're actually thinking about exiting or actually the day you start, because you never know. Somebody might come in and offer you something for your business. may sound like a really good price, but is it? Yeah. Or it may be a really good price, but you think your business is worth a lot more and it's not, and then you regret having not done it at that time. So knowing and building is is a key component of being able to exit on your own terms. Yeah. Yeah. And timing can be a huge component of that, right? And and so nowadays, we just came through this COVID-19 pandemic and, and who would have known a week ago that we'd also be talking about riots in the streets throughout, you know, the country and, and everything that's kind of going on. And so I think everything is a a little bit unstable right now. People are worried. What does the outlook look like? People can't figure out why the stock market's doing well now over the last couple of weeks when Mm -hmm. we're right in the middle of all this turmoil. And, and obviously that's, that's my area of expertise. And so I can, I can speak to that, but we're here to talk to, you know, about (laughs) you. So, you know, given the environment that we're in today, there are still some business owners that are going to need or want to sell today. So tell us a little bit about what you think about the market today and the environment for selling a business today. There are um, actually three things going on today. We're going to see a lot of businesses just close their doors. In fact, it's yeah. already started. You you see this in newspaper after newspaper of, of somebody's story, 10 years, 5 years, 8 years, 20 years. They're just closing their doors. Yeah. that That's one of the unfortunate consequences. Yeah. Second, those who have thought that they were in an exit this year, 
A lot still are, but the structure of the deal is going to be very different. So knowing what your minimum threshold of cash you need to live in the future is going to be even more critical because the structure, and by structure, I mean the cash you get up front and the terms, the length of the terms and the amount of those, there's going to be more contingencies and earnouts than we've seen since our last quote unquote little recession. Sure. Um, And so there's just yesterday, I got a call. He was ready to sell this year. And now he's like, okay, should we, or should we build up? Yeah. And the answer is, of course, it depends. Yep. On the situation. So we talk through people and, and we introduce our clients to others who can help them build that wealth or help them grow through acquisition so they can meet those goals. And by doing that, we work in tandem with their financial advisor, their accountant, their attorney, and everybody is rowing in the same direction. Nobody's trying to minimize taxes. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Uh, for for the year without thinking about long term two to three years out. If 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 you don't talk to your advisors about your plans, they cannot help you. Yep. Yeah, you know, it's funny that you mentioned it that way because I'll I'll personally speak to clients a lot of times or even at, uh, as a prospect and say, you know, the, the reason that my clients end up hiring me, even though they've done some level of financial planning, because most people that I'm meeting with have already done some level of financial planning on their own, right? Either on their own or, or with other, you know, advisors. And it may be an investment advisor, insurance advisor, tax advisor, whatever. But the big difference is that they want to take it to the next level. And what's missing is the coordination. There's yes. typically a lack of coordination between all of the advisors. Correct. And if we're not all, like you said, rowing in the same direction, then we can't accomplish it. A CPA is always looking through that tax minimization lens, yes. right? And then the attorney is looking through the legal aspects of it. A financial advisor may be looking at, okay, how do we structure this? And, you know, you're, you're going to do some of that as well. But a financial advisor may be saying, what, what are we going to do in terms of cash today? What does the earn out look like? And then how do we figure out how that money is going to take you into the future that you're hoping to have, right? Correct. You know, it's not necessarily about retirement, but it's about financial independence that can be created from this business that you've put your blood, sweat, and tears into. And everybody has to be rowing in that same direction, like you said, in order to make that happen. Correct. And you will see a lot of times they're not rowing altogether. Yeah. Yeah, it's unfortunate. I mean, there there typically needs to be a quarterback of the team, so to speak, that's that's helping the whole team row in the same direction. And everybody needs to be sitting around the table together to plan it with mm-hmm. that business owner. And nine times out of 10, that is not happening for business owners. Correct. And especially at the upper Main Street, lower m a level, under the stock market level, which yep. is, you know, 90 to 99% of our businesses here in the U.S. <laughs> yep, absolutely. <laughs> we, we've just find that without the right team, the frustration level, the, the wants, the desires, the after selling the business is not all it's cracked up to be um, because it wasn't set up right. One of the first things we ask both both our sellers and our, 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 our buyers, our, our business owners who are looking to buy or acquire, why is it you want to do this? And why is it you want to do this at this time? You've got to have a good reason because you've got to be able to move your identity from business owner And as we were talking about, you know, change of identity, change from professor to not, it's a huge identity issue. No doubt. Or business owner to general contractor part as on our own home. Just the change in thought processes and what you can say and how to say it. You're shifting. So you better have a good reason why you want to sell something to do, look forward to, as opposed to leave behind. Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, I think we see that in a lot of aspects of life, right? Not necessarily just in selling a business, but transitioning from working to not working every day uh, is not something that everybody is prepared for and they don't think through the consequences. And like you said, it's, it's a lot of times business owners, we will focus on the financials, right? Or, or how is this going to benefit me financially? Or how is this going to benefit the business overall? But not thinking about 
the drawbacks and, and what else needs to go into that uh, decision, mm -hmm. right? And the emotional side, you know, without, you know, not crying emotional, but the emotional or the mindset side of things is, is just as important as the financial side and the operational side of, of the decision that you're making. It is, or you can sabotage your own deal very easily as well. Yeah. So, so given with what we're talking about here, would you say that business owners that are coming to you right now, like you said, we, the estimates are going to be 20 to 30% of some of small businesses may never reopen their doors or will shutter their doors, you know, in the next six months, for example. And so that's obviously just a, a statistic that is awe-inspiring to think about because that's, I mean, that's a lot, a lot, a lot of people who are out of work. We already know that multiple millions of, tens of millions of people are out of work today um, because of everything that's gone on. I truly believe that entrepreneurs and innovators will lead us out of this, right? Because 99% of, of businesses in America are small businesses, yes. right? Over half of the population works for a small business. So there, I believe that we will come out of this. It's going to take some time. But given where we are today, do you think that it's a good time for business owners who have the ability to, to weather the storm, right? Ride this out. Is it a good time to be looking at acquisition opportunities that may be out there where maybe somebody's not able to to weather the storm? And so there's an opportunity to kind of almost throw them a lifeline, give them an opportunity to still have an exit, but it's beneficial to your business as well. Yes. In fact, if we were talking in December you know, of 2019 or January, one of the major reasons people were acquiring companies was for their employees. Trained employees um, were coming in. People were merging and moving together. That opportunity is probably still going to be there, except now we don't know. Yeah. Because uh, once people left, they may or may not come back. Nobody knows what's going to go on. Yeah. Um, we are talking to a lot of sea level individuals who say, I'm done. I've been downsized, outsized, right-sized just one too many times. I want my own business that yeah. I can grow. We have the cash we've saved. Um, so they are coming in as very strong buyers. Hmm. And we have other small companies in certain industries that are saying, I don't care what you find in this industry. If it meets X, Y, and Z criteria, we'll buy it. I'm interested. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, I, I guess I hadn't thought about it that way, but it does make sense that in December of 2019, there was there was literally a talent shortage, right? Correct. And like you said, so they were buying it because they wanted that talent. Employees weren't really looking for jobs. They were happy. The, the whole country was overly employed, right? Lowest mm -hmm. employment that we'd had in decades, if not ever. And so it does make sense that that was the case. And, and now it's, I'm sure there's still some of that, like you said, but it, it's comforting for me to hear that you're speaking with C-level executives that are just saying, you know what, I'm tired of the corporate rat race and the changes that are going on and me not controlling my own destiny. And these are very capable people who have the ability to just go out on their own and build a business on their own. And it's still, as I'm sure you're aware, uh, starting a business is always more expensive than buying one for two reasons. One, you get cash flow on day one. <laughs> True. Yep. And not having to build up to cash flow. Yep. Two, you have employees on day one who know what they're doing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Very, very, very good points and, and smart points for sure. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. if you can acquire a business that's already operating, but you're looking at it and saying, yeah, that's a fair price. But I know that with what I bring to the table now, I can 10x that business because I bring something to the table to the table that that business does not currently have. Correct. Yeah. So very, very, very smart decision, I think. So given the, the atmosphere today and COVID-19 and PPP loans and all those that sorts of things that are out there, what have you seen in the way that that's affected valuations of businesses? We have been doing a lot of webinars like everybody else, ourselves and going to them. In fact, we're doing an updated PPP webinar on Thursday to go over what's going on new at 1.30. But the goal of the loans is that you really need to document. I don't care what you got a loan for, document, document, 
document. And so the rules are changing and transitions are still going on with the PPP and without. And at this time, the latest thing that we have heard, which might change any day, is that if you have a PPP loan that goes to the individual, not the company. So in a stock sale, it's not transferable. In an asset sale, it's not transferable. You're responsible for that loan, even if you sell your business. Mm. And likewise, if you buy one. But they're coming up with legal ways to make that all work because we, we are closing businesses. The other thing, right now, as you know, what do we have? Very low interest rates. Yeah. And the SBA, uh, this is another item that's being discussed on what the terms actually are. But as of September 27th, if you get that loan before, an SBA loan before, the SBA will pay six months of payments. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's a big deal. And, and even if you had one prior to all of this happening, they did put a, a six-month forbearance in place for business owners that already had an SBA loan. Which Correct. has helped a tremendous amount of businesses to kind of keep their doors open and, and have options anyhow and not have that be a drag on their cash flow while all this is going on. So I, I want to follow up a little bit on that in, in just a minute, but now's a good time to take a, a quick break to hear a word from one of our sponsors. At Paylocity, we deliver more than our awesome product suite with crazy good reviews. We prioritize your success by covering you with a deep support system to back up our easy to use, innovative HR solutions. Everything we do is designed to support you in reaching your goals. Together, we tackle your day-to-day work so that you can spend more time building the culture you and your employees crave. For professionals who crave true partnership, Paylocity is the HR and payroll company that frees you from the tasks of today, so together we can spend more time focused on the promise of tomorrow. Let's go forward together. Okay, welcome back. I I do want to say that Paylocity is a fantastic partner, so if you're in the market for payroll help, they, they are definitely somebody to look into. But we are here today with Lisa Riley. We've been talking obviously about businesses overall. Is it a, time to, a good time to sell? Is it a good time to look at opportunities for acquisition? Um, but we were just talking about PPP loans and, and you mentioned there's a webinar coming up. So I'll have you give us the information on that, but also give us kind of a preview of of what you're going to talk about. And right now there's new legislation being looked at to try to change it. There are plenty of business owners who have received PPP loan funds and are looking at it and saying, is eight weeks really long enough to be able to to deploy that capital, is it smart for us to deploy that capital and make sure 75% of it goes for payroll, those sorts of things, um, and then still potentially be out of business because we just used all that capital to be able to have it be forgiven. So, you know, let, let's talk a little bit about that and then you can give us the information on the webinar as well that you're going to host on Thursday. That's exactly what we're talking about. Things are changing daily. We actually did one a couple of weeks ago. And last week, everybody says, won't you do it again? (laughs) We were going to do a monthly series on different aspects about what you need to do to prepare your business for sale, thinking about selling, buying a business, terms, all of those aspects. It's 30 minutes, cut it off. Hmm. Done. Part of that is that the webinars, the podcasts, the we're, we're on information overload. Yeah. Everyone is. Yeah, we are. So we'll have it, and uh, Juliet Peters from Framework Legal is talking about the legal issues. Helen Swiatek from On The Money is talking about the accounting issues and and how you should keep your books. But what we're going to be really talking about is, hey, even if you're working with your accountant and they tell you to document and get the paperwork in right away, nope, slow it down a little bit because we're still changing the rules. Yeah. And you may be able to modify, use things differently. Document, pick a point in time and document, 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 put the paperwork all together like you're going to have it turned in and then modify it based on when the final whatever comes out. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. No, I I think that it's important. We do know that it's going to be super important to document, right? And we've got to be able to show that the money was spent the way that it was authorized to be spent in order for it to be forgiven, right? But like you said, it's a fluid situation. 
you know, and, and if I look at it for myself as a business owner, would it really be a smart decision for me to, to spend that much money, depending on what it is and, you know, what your payroll looked like and the formula that was put in place there for it to be two and a half months worth of payroll? If I got to send, spend 75% of that in eight weeks, like I said, right before the break, does that make sense, right? I mean, I'm employing people to potentially do nothing, right? Or to do something to kind of, you know, better the business in the long term. But if things don't turn around, right? So think retail, for example, if people aren't willing to go back into the shopping malls yet and buy things from your kiosk or from your retail outlet or whatever it is, but you've got people sitting there doing nothing, but there's nobody in the mall, that's not really the smartest business decision in the long run. So you've also got to look at it and say, well, it's still a pretty decent interest rate, but they also want me to pay it back in two years. Yeah, there, you know, there's a six month wait on the repayment, but then I got to pay it all back in 18 months. And so it, I just feel like they're, you know, obviously they're looking at it. They're getting a lot of feedback from business owners saying, thank you, but, right? <laughs> and that's that's where we are. Yeah, and the house is, is already has put out a whole new a policy that the Senate is working at. And we're going to get some conglomeration probably. Yeah. Um, I thought we might have it Monday. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now, what, what we've learned is that nothing goes quickly with government, right? Yeah. So, but the other thing is, is on that loan and all the certifications now required to be signed off. So, uh, the the payroll protection program was set for payroll. So you're going to have to certify that you were. When you got it, you were intending to use it for payroll. Even if you don't use it now, the intention was there. And that's why I'm saying document, document, document. Yeah. So it could be right, you know, what you're certifying at time A, B, and C, and you sign. But life changes. So document those changes. Yeah. Um, yeah, good good feedback. I I mean, I I agree. Because like you said, it is meant for payroll. (laughs) But... We don't necessarily know if it's the right decision to spend it all on payroll during the first eight weeks, you know, after you've received it. But so hopefully they get that figured out and it ends up being better for businesses overall, because I think that something like that will help many businesses to be able to stay open. Yes. And and right now it's it's looking pretty bleak uh, out there. So. But I don't want to get, you know, go negative because there are plenty of businesses that are taking advantage of what's going on right now and doing quite well as well. So Lots of industries are rocking and rolling and yeah. those businesses have tripled and quadrupled their Yeah, <laughs> yeah <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. And, and like I said earlier, entrepreneurs and innovators figure out a way, mm-hmm. right? You yes. know, I was driving this morning and there was a lady in front of me that just had stickers on the back of her, of her windshield that said custom masks text or call this number, right? So you figure out a way to do something that continues to grow revenue or build a business or acquire or something, you know, right now. So, you know, if you were a small business owner today, which you are, of course, but if if you were today operating a business, what would you do or what do you, what kind of advice do you give to business owners that are listening to this program on what they can do today to increase the value of their business? The number one thing we always talk about is having good financial records, so working those discretionary expenses out of your tax returns, <laughs> um, especially the closer you get to deciding or three to five years before you're out. That bottom line on your tax return, yes, yes, we can adjust for both EBITDA or seller's discretionary earnings and add back things. But as a buyer, I don't care if your Costco bill has your private uh, purchases on it. It went through the business. It was used in the business. Yeah. So. They, they want it cleaner. They don't want to necessarily have to have a big long list of things that you were you know, paying as discretionary expenses through the business. There have been a couple of businesses and these have been small, you know, one about a million in revenue and the other one uh, a little less. Um, but they were the cleanest darn books I'd ever seen on a small business. All we added back was an owner operator salary and the payroll tax and their their comps plus depreciation interest and amortization. Hmm. They ran a nothing discretionary through their business. Well, the due diligence on a buyer and getting them through that sale that process 
they're getting a better price. One got it. We've already worked on that. Um, better price, higher price, just because their documents were so clean and there were yeah. no ad backs. And second is that they exited on their own terms. They got to dictate, you know, when they were going. Yeah. Yeah, no, I think that that you're right. It's rare to see that in a small business, right? Mm -hmm. Because most of the time they're just- We all do it. (laughs) (laughs) Everybody runs the discretionary expenses through. I'm guilty of it myself. Yes, Um, because they are true business expenses, how we run our businesses. Um, And they are true the way we run it, but not necessarily the way someone else would need to run it. Correct. Yeah, and really it comes down to making the transition excuse me, the transaction less cumbersome to try to figure out the numbers and and figure out the value. That's really why it becomes easier to sell the business at that point. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you you used a term, you said exit on their own terms, right? So give me some feedback on what you mean by a business owner exiting on their own terms and what they can really do to to push that value of the business up and then exit on their own terms. They had, there are three things besides good books and records, Um, working yourself out of the day-to-day job. If you're doing the service or um, selling from the front of the office, let somebody else do that. Hire somebody to do that. That's a really hard thing for business owners to wrap their heads around, right? And I've Mm -hmm. I've had multiple conversations with my own clients and saying, "You, you need to understand that if you can go on vacation for six months and the business runs well or better without you there, guess what? Your value just went through the roof, right? <laughs> exactly. And they don't realize that. They don't think about it. Oh, I'm the best salesman. I built this you know, business from the ground up. And, and yes, you did, but you're looking to ultimately sell it to somebody else and you're not going with that business. So if you if they can kind of position it that way in their minds, they they do start to get it. But it's a ri- initially a business owner hears that it doesn't make any sense to them. This is my business. It is my business. Why? Why? What do you mean you don't want me to be in the day to day? So, mm-hmm. yeah, I'm glad you brought that up. And second is that if one customer or, or has twenty five to thirty five to fifty percent of your revenues. Start diversifying. Yeah, um, it's really hard for a buyer to come in and say that customer is going to stay when you leave. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Especially if you brought them in yourself and you're the relationship manager, for example. Mm-hmm. All those sorts of things it makes it tough for an outside buyer to look at it and, and provide and give value to that. Yeah. Yeah. And the same way, if you have a supplier relationship and their family, <laughs> make oh. sure you're paying. Fair market value. Yeah, market rates. <laughs> uh, for whatever it is they're doing for you. <laughs> yeah. It will just make the transition easier. If you own your own building, pay rent. Your accountant can really help you out there. They can they can set it up as another entity yeah. and you can pay yourself rent. Yep, absolutely. Yeah, we talk about that a fair amount as well, Len and I with our clients and it's a great way to to structure it. And then, oh, by the way, you can sell the business, but hold on to the real estate and still maintain that revenue. So there's there's an added benefit to that side as well. Mm-hmm. And then the other aspect is, is that you don't ever want to be held hostage by any employee. So make sure you've got contracts with your employees. Make sure that everything doesn't reside in your head or in their heads. Document those processes and procedures. Document your systems. Doesn't matter if it's just you right now. Just start putting the different hats you wear down yep. and what you're doing. You'll grow into it. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think if you do do that throughout time, right? Because mm-hmm. almost all small business owners start out as a sole proprietor, right? And they're going to grow their business themselves. And then it's a big step to hire that first employee and then the second and then the third. But if you're accustomed to keeping those types of documents and the processes and all that kind of stuff in place rather than, oh, now I'm at 10 people. I've got 10 employees. I probably should put together an employee manual and I probably should do this. And, you know, it, it's just easier if you start from the get-go. And you can always hire that out for somebody else to do it. Or if you're paying these employees, those employees right now, 
have them write down their duties, have them write down what they do, whoever opens the business. Just have them start documenting. We've been telling a lot of our clients, if you're paying individuals, and it's a lot slower right now, there are things you can do that they can help you grow your business that you haven't even thought about. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I think that uh, it doesn't have to be overly complicated. But having some sort of a process in place, like you said, increases the value. It gives an outside buyer the opportunity to see that you do have your ducks in a row, right? Um, You can outsource it if you need to. Mm -hmm. But this is another thing that's really hard for business owners to do is to take that step back (laughs) and work on the business, not in the business, right? And we spend every day working in the business. Mm -hmm. But the, the biggest power in trying to take that business from point A to point C is is about taking that step back and working on the business rather yeah. than in it. And that makes your business more valuable on so many levels to a buyer too, when you have that management team. Yeah, absolutely. Well, let's take a quick break and, and listen to uh, another word from one of our sponsors. And then I want to come back and talk, ask you a few more things. Whether you're an established local company or a brand new startup, you can count on GBS to be part of your family. We're not just any benefits consulting firm, we're GBS. We have nearly 30 years of experience in group benefits, a strong sense of purpose, and it shows. GBS, believe in something better. GBSbenefits.com. Welcome back. We're here with Lisa Riley with Delta Business Advisors. We've, We've talked about quite a few things already about getting a business ready to build and sell. And uh, we just heard a word from one of our sponsors, GBS Benefits, fantastic benefits firm here uh, in Arizona. They've also got offices in other cities, Las Vegas, Salt Lake City, and plenty of other places. They do a great, great job uh, with benefits. So if you need a great partner from Group Benefits, look out uh, for or look up GBS Benefits and, and they'll be help, able to help you out. So Lisa, we've talked about a lot of things so far. We um, have. So a couple of things I want you to do. First, I want you to tell us where they should look for you to find the webinar that we talked about on Thursday, because I don't think we we actually hit that. So, you know, what website should they go to or where do they find you on social to be able to get on that webinar? And then I'll have you, you know, just give us your overall contact information, how to get a hold of you. But then I want kind of your final words of wisdom. What you're seeing, is there a specific industry that you specialize in? Can you help anybody? You know, what kind of final words of wisdom for a business owner who's thinking, gosh, you know what, three to five years, maybe 10 years from now, I I do want to be able to exit this business and and have it be a cash event at that point. Just kind of the final words of wisdom on what you would do today if you were in that position. Okay. A lot to go over there. First and foremost, (laughs) some of it I'll just put together. Um, DeltaBusinessAdvisors.com and that's A-D-V-I-S-O. RS.com. If you go under resources and the COVID-19, you'll find the link that you can click on for the webinar. Additionally, if you um, look me up on LinkedIn, you'll find it or Facebook or Delta Business Advisors, you'll find us all over there. Great. We, we try to put out educational information. As I said, I'm an educator by, <laughs> yeah. by nature. I like uh, having conversations and getting getting the right information out there. There is a, a lot that you can do. There are resources galore out there to increase the business. We are we partner and co-broke with a lot of different business brokers. Yeah. In Arizona, you have to be a licensed real estate agent to be a business broker. <laughs> Little known fact. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I'm working with a national company accounting biz brokers, and they're out of the South in Georgia, but they just focus on accounting firms. So we've got Hmm. that specialization in accounting firms. We've got specializations in different industries. I Last year, I had like five auto service stations and so on Hmm. we, we sold. So what we look for more than industry, to be honest, is a cash flow and a seller who understands the value of their business. Their expectations are in alignment with what 
that value is uh, complementary. Most probable sales price analysis is what we do. Mm -hmm. And that range is, hey, if you need to sell it, you know, right away, or if you have the six months to a year that it takes to sell a well-priced business, then you can hit near the upper limit on Main Street. Yeah. On lower middle market, we do not take a price point out to the market because it truly is what somebody's willing to buy for it. Sure. On Main Street, you would not, people want to know what is it and how did you get to this value? Two different markets. Sure. So we work with both and we work with investment bankers as well to make sure that um, those companies who need capital can get capital. And we can do alternative structures. Let's see. What was the rest of the question? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no. I'll, they all I'll need to came out me. <laughs> I, I did throw a lot at you. I apologize. So you, you did actually a very, very good job of, of remembering um, things there. So one thing that I would highlight there is that you do help individuals to find the financing to get this done. So that's a, that's an important part because there's not always uh, that ability or somebody doesn't have the expertise or the contacts to get the financing in place. And so that helps a seller, but it also helps a buyer to make sure that they're comfortable in, in moving forward with a transaction like this. So that's very, very good to hear. The last part of what I asked you was actually just advice for somebody who's sitting in their truck today listening to to this program and saying, I do need to start preparing myself to sell the business because I, I do want to be done in five years or 10 years. What what small tidbit of advice would you give them today beyond what we've talked about or maybe just reiterate something that we've talked about? If you had to choose one piece of advice that a, that a business owner should do today to prepare themselves for that, what would it be? I'd pick the top three. Okay. One is getting your financials in order. So, if you were going to buy your business, you would understand it very clearly and there wouldn't be anything that was in doubt. Yeah. So Two, good point. You're looking at your business as though you were going to buy it today. And how would you feel about the financials that you're viewing? Good. Two, you've got a good management team and you are not working on the day-to-day -day in the business. Good. Very good. And three you have something pulling you away. So you've got to have a hobby. You might want to, you know, travel the world. You, you, playing golf does not work. Many sellers get who've sold and just say, oh, I just want to play golf. That doesn't work for either them or their spouse. Correct. <laughs> um, you've got to have a good a why. Why am I selling? Do I want to do more volunteer work? Do I want to travel? Do I want to go live in another county with my grandchildren? Or do I want to build another business? We have a lot of 20s, 30 years old who are also selling yeah. because they've grown the business. Their excitement is in growing the business to a certain point. And then they're done. Yeah, yeah absolutely. <laughs> and they want that challenge again to go buy another. So why? You know, why is it time? No, I think that that's very good advice. I mean, and you're absolutely right. We had um, Brenda Schmidt on the program a couple of weeks mm -hmm. ago with Coplex, and you know, she talked, and she's she's not in that twenty to thirty year range. She's a little bit older than that, but you know, she said, and and we do see it more often in twenty to thirty year old um, entrepreneurs. But she said that she thinks she's got two more startups in her before she's ready to retire. So for her, it really is about that chase and the build. But she doesn't necessarily want to run the operations day to day. And so she moves on to the next startup. Yeah. And, and there is a fair amount of that. Um, but I, I agree with you specifically on something that's pulling you away, right? Sure. And, and I don't know if you've seen this. And if not, I'll, I'll send it to you after the program. But one of the things that we'll use with our clients is called the Business Exit Readiness Index, yes. the Barry Report. Mm -hmm. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with that, but it, it's not just about the financials, right? I mean, it asks those types of questions, but it's really more about, are you emotionally ready to step away from this business mm -hmm. and will you be okay, so to speak, right? Mm -hmm. And and it just gets discounted so much and people don't realize how much of their identity is tied to the business that they've just built over the last 10, 15, 20, 30 years, right? 40 years. And so it, it, it is, it's an important aspect to being ready to exit the business. And that takes us back to um, when you, you were talking about 
leaving for six months and letting him in. Go find your hobby. Go find something you want to do. Go find a desire. Yeah. And it might not be six months. It might be a week or it might be two days. Yeah. Just start stepping away and making sure your business can run just fine. See what happens. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I think that it's 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 excellent advice. My wife and I speak about it all the time. My wife and I are coming up on our on our twenty second wedding anniversary. Congrats. Yeah, thank you. And so, you know, we've we've talked about what the future looks like. And I've got a business that I run day to day. I know that, you know, you're looking at me thinking he's got a face for radio. This isn't <laughs> what I do all day, every day. But uh, the, the reality is we talk about what our future looks like, right? And, and my wife and I are in our mid to late 40s, and we've still got plenty of time to decide exactly what that looks like. But we're already having those conversations and saying, well, maybe we can kind of ease into it. You know, yeah. maybe we will do some volunteer work and step away from the business for 12 months at a time and do that volunteer work. And then come back, you know, for a year or two and then go away for another year and and just kind of ease into it. There are lots of ways to prepare yourself for that. But I've seen it way too many times where you sell that business, the transaction's done, and you wake up the next Monday morning and you're thinking, what have I done? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've got some money in the bank and that's great, but what have I done? My identity's gone. Mm -hmm. And so it is, there's so much to the emotional aspect of getting ready to sell a business well beyond the finances. Yes. So, well, I appreciate the conversation, Lisa. I think that uh, we've we've covered some very important topics. Hopefully, business owners are listening and and realizing, you know, even if they just take one thing from this, you know, for me, I would say take that you've got to emotionally prepare yourself for for exiting the business. You may say on you know the financials, get your financials in order, but either way, there's really really good inf- information here that hopefully they listen and glean some information and prepare themselves for for their uh, exit going forward and get in touch with Lisa Riley at Delta Business Advisors to prepare yourself for that uh, eventual exit. Thank you, Austin. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for being here. Thank you, everybody. And that's a wrap for today. You've been listening to Tycoons of Small Biz, proudly hosted by Austin Peterson and Landon Mance. Austin and Landon are comprehensive financial planning professionals specializing in financial, estate, and succession planning for small business owners. Austin and Landon have offices in Scottsdale, Arizona, and Las Vegas, Nevada, and represent clients in 14 states throughout the country. Join Austin, Landon, and the Featured Tycoons live every Tuesday at 1 p.m. right here on Business Radio X and your favorite podcast 